Hi everybody, I'm glad you're joining me again where we're continuing to talk about how to hear God well and this time rather than uh, specifically referring to what not to listen to or you know fine-tuning what you're paying attention to I'm more sharing this time along the lines of the methodology by which God can communicate. And I really do say this to the last because this is the least important way to hear God. I know that's quite a a bold statement to make, but as you'll see what, what I mean by that in that in that the Word of God is primary it has to be the absolute foundation where you draw all your understanding from by other means if you for instance I will be talking about dreams And dreams, as an example, do not take precedence over what the Word of God says. So we we will be, I'll be sharing some examples here about dreams, but they always want to be in line with what God has already revealed to us by His Word. Because God is not schizophrenic. God doesn't say one thing in a dream, which is contrary to what he has already moved the authors of the Bible to write down exactly as they are written. The Word of God is incorruptible and established firm in the heavens forever. It's not just, oh, a book that has some words of God. No, the Bible is the Word of God. And you can't just say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. (laughs) Okay? So that's why I say this to the last, because I don't want to put, you know, get people on a foundation to have the ability to become literally flaky Christians. You know, where they just go by a, a tingle that they get or some really awesome dream that they had and never regard what the Word of God has to say about that first. So, but this will be interesting and fun to go over because it is, of course, revealed many times in the Word how God speaks to us in dreams, for instance. And we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater Right? So we want to acknowledge that many times God keeps us out of a a disaster, for instance, or encourages us for a long walk. Uh, Anyway, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself. But first of all, uno, uno, numero uno, one, you know, first of all, It's the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into all truth. It's not of your own dreaming that gets you to walking with God successfully. It's the Holy Spirit who gives you understanding and reveals things to you that are yet to come. Even as Jesus said here in John 16, 13, He said, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he, not not dreams, not visions, not prophecies, not, it says he, he is a person. He, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So Holy Spirit is here to reveal things to us that Jesus has laid up for us to enjoy. 
you know, works that he has ordained before the foundation of the world for us to walk in. And he will show us things to come. You know, he will reveal to us our destinies and and encourage us and bring to our remembrance everything that he has spoken to us, even as it says also in John fourteen twenty six. Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he's not keeping us in the dark. <laughs> and I, I'm sure you know that by now through all these teachings, that it's his good pleasure for us to understand the things of the kingdom and and reveal and bring to our remembrance things that he has spoken to us and encourage us along the way as we walk with him he will remind us and you know just as a parent teaches their child you know you don't tell your child one thing one time and that's it you know no children Normally, they need to be told over and over and over again, reassured, comforted of what you as a parent are providing them or des- you know, wa- desire for them to walk in, you know, the abundance, reminder, so to say, right? So the, we did touch on this briefly, but I definitely want to make sure that we were all on the same page that being baptized in the Spirit is essential to really walking successfully with God. And it's prophesied here in Isaiah 28. So in verse 10, it says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, and line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Doesn't that sound like you would talk to a child, right? For with stammering lips in another tongue, he will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Look at that. But they would not hear. So hopefully you all out there are not those who would not hear. Because it says clearly right there with a stammering lips and another tongue. That's talking about praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in other tongues. That that is how God reveals wisdom and precept upon precept and line upon line teaching to us. And as we pray in the Spirit, we can pray for understanding and an interpretation of those words that we pray to our Heavenly Father with. And this isn't the the teaching for a baptism in Holy Spirit, but that's what I'm speaking about. And that as we pray in the Holy Spirit, that is the means by which God can quicken to our remembrance the things that He's told us and revealed truth to us. And as it says right there, Oh my goodness, the the crux of the Christian walk is to lead and guide us into rest and refreshment. That is a huge, huge part of our inheritance as Christians, that we have an inner peace and rest that the world cannot possess without faith in Christ. It's, it's a supernatural peace that just keeps us and preserves us. And when we lean on and walk in the Holy Spirit, pray in the Holy Spirit, that literally imparts rest and refreshment to your soul. And don't you know, in this world that's topsy-turvy and dark, 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 crazy, nutso... <laughs> We need all the rest and refreshment we can get. And so my encouragement to you when we're talking about walking with him and and understanding him, hearing him well, definitely, definitely 
be baptized in the Holy Spirit if you haven't already and continue in that. Don't just get baptized once and say, oh yeah, I prayed a few words and then move on. No, Holy Spirit is your helper day in and day out. And so you pray, pray consistently, pray regularly. And you'll, in a, in a way, store up help when you need it. So you don't wait to dire circumstances to build up a relationship with someone like that, right? You, when you have a, you've built upon a relationship with a person, speaking of Holy Spirit in this case, then you are, when that situation that you hope you never would have to face may come upon you, well, you already are in a good position of a, you know, a secure relationship by your continually dwelling with him and walking with him. I'm not saying that you lose your salvation. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying there's a difference between your eternal salvation, which is secure through Jesus Christ, and experiencing the abundant life here in this world which is manifested by your continual dwelling by relationship, by intimate relating with God regularly. It, it, you know, a great example of this is just with people. You know, just as an example, if I have a neighbor next to me that I never reach out to, I mean, ever. In other words, I don't even know their name. I never talked to them. Well, if I went over there, you know, like I had some disaster, heaven forbid, and I needed immediate help, and I went over there to knock on their door and say, oh my gosh, will you help me? Take me to the hospital and pay my bill for me while you're at it. Well, we don't have a relationship, and they probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't even have confidence to go over there and ask them of that. So in a similar way, if we are in a dire situation, you know, we find ourselves in a bad situation, you don't want to wait till then to try and develop a close relationship with your Heavenly Father. That's just my encouragement. You know, start developing that relationship with a close by, a close conversation with Him day in and day out. And then that way you're building up a confidence that you know his voice. So when you do need help, I mean, uh, you find yourself in a dire situation, man, it's great then when you have when you pray and you're like, "Oh my gosh, I need this help. What what? What do I do?" Well, you'll hear his voice cuz you're so used to walking with him day in and day out. You don't want to wait to that horrible situation to try and manufacture something that you can't manufacture. That's something that just comes by an ongoing relationship. I'm talking about the confidence that you can receive from him when you ask for his help. It's never, never, never God withholding from you, but it's your ability to confidently receive what you need. So God is so good all the time and he will, any which way, he will try and find an avenue to help you. But if you are have been tuning yourself out, in the sense you're deaf and you're dumb, spiritually speaking, then it's going to be hard for you to receive what he's pouring out in the spirit realm. So anyway... I say all that to, you know, again, encourage everybody out there that it's all by Holy Spirit. All th these means and methods that he communicates to us is all by the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit does not contradict himself. Right? So, speaking of dreams, as it's shared many times in the Word, one example is in Job. So let's go there 
in Job 33, 14, it says, For God may speak in one way or another, yet man does not perceive it. And that's exactly what I was talking about a moment ago. You know, man has a difficult time perceiving things of the Spirit. If not, it's impossible. <laughs> in verse 15, In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So God clearly speaks in dreams and vision to mourn and seal in instruction in men's hearts and this is just one instance of an example of that isn't the God so wonderful and you hear of testimonies I mean many places where people say I you know I, I was uh, Muslim and Jesus appeared to me when I was asleep one night and you know just speaking to people supernaturally like it says right there in Job to seal in instruction and warn them if they are going the wrong way, right? And, uh, you know, some examples are, and I'm not going to go through all these examples, but uh, Joseph is a wonderful testimony of God's given, uh, blessing this man of God with dreams that encouraged him through the long haul. And that's one really good thing about dreams is that if you have been assured in your heart of what God wants to do in your life, you know, you've gotten that that witness of his plan for your life, your destiny, your calling. And yet, it's a long time coming. <laughs> If it's a really long time coming, it's wonderful to have some dreams to sink your heels into to encourage you and the, to, to walk, continue walking it out, right? And that's, you know, Joseph. I'm talking about Joseph, um, not Mary's Joseph, but Joseph um, of the, you know, in Genesis where his brother sold him off to Egypt. I mean, they were cruel, cruel, cruel. They almost came short of killing him, right? So it says here in Genesis 37, and here in verse 5, it says, Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I've dreamed. There, there we were, binding sheaves in the field, then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams for his war and for his words. Verse 9, And then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So there are two different dreams that God encouraged, definitely God dreams that God enc encouraged J Jacob, I mean, sorry, Joseph with. And it was really, I'm sure, very helpful for Joseph to endure those many, many years being so mistreated in the land of Egypt. Because that's where his brother sent him up. You know, they sold him off to as a slave. And, and then finally, literally, 
Joseph became second in command, even as those dreams indicated, and the dreams finally came to fruition. His brothers came to him in the land of famine and bowed down to their brother Joseph, literally. And those dreams were fulfilled. So God speaks to us in dreams, most surely. And I mean, there's other examples like King Nebuchadnezzar, um, Jake, the Jacob dreamed of a ladder reaching up to heaven in Genesis 28, 12. Paul was caught up to the third heaven, he said, so he saw a vision. And then even, you know, I mean, the book of Revelation, the entire book is a vision that Apostle John had. So, and we base much of our end times doctrine in, on, in that book. So dreams, visions are very significant uh, of how, you know, confirming how God speaks to us. And again, they really need to line up with the word. If they don't line up with the word first, then put them on the shelf. <laughs> That's what I call it. You know, just they might be nice, but... If it doesn't, well, actually, if it doesn't agree with the word, then toss it because God's not going to contradict himself. But if it's an encouraging word that doesn't yet confirm with your heart about something that God has spoken to you by the word, then, you know, I put it on, that's what I mean by put it on the shelf. You know, wait for another witness by the spirit you know, that's just not, I wouldn't launch out and act on a dream that's definitely not made alive in your heart, a wit witness by the Holy Spirit in the Word, right? And then you can also have, pe I call them pizza dreams. You know, I mean, many times that's what they can be, is <laughs> it's just because dreams are in the soul realm. And they cannot be led of God. They're just leftover thoughts that you're cleansing out of your soul. You know, I mean, they're just soulless dreams, just like you can have crazy thoughts in the daytime, right? So another example is with Ab Abimelech. I'm saying that wrong. In Genesis 37. I mean, we were just in Genesis 37. This is Genesis 20, I mean. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her and said, He said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself, said he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And, the, and God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me, Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So that was quite a warning, wasn't it? <laughs> quite a bold command. But it, God is so good that even though this man, Abimelech, was misled, he was still mercifully warned by God in that dream. And he followed through with it, fortunately. And Sarah did not conceive um, an impure seed, so to say. You know, I mean, she was being preserved by God through this means, for the promised seed, so profound, through a dream. 
So God speaks to us in dreams. And again, even uh, we will definitely want to touch on Mary and Joseph, right? And here in Matthew 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call him his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." Isn't that beautiful? So Mary and Joseph's marriage was preserved through this dream. And the prophecy of Jesus' name and birth was given through this dream. So God uses dreams. I think I've kind of definitely nailed that down. <laughs> So definitely keep your ears open and, and, you know, write down dreams and, and help let the Holy Spirit encourage you and uh, show you the symbolism. Because many times dreams, as we've seen in these, in these examples, are symbolic and you can, and, you know, have a, a, an encouraging time understanding what the symbolism is of those dreams because God speaks to us definitely in symbols too and you know like Joseph's sheaves right that bowed down to his and and the stars and the moon and the sun you know just all these types and shadows are symbolic of what's in the spirit realm what's true in the spirit realm right so I did want to also mention with with regard to dreams, uh, as in the case of Abimelech, you can receive a very stern rebuke like he did, and it be of God. So, but you know, a lot of times I'm just giving you a couple tips here. Um, if it's a warning, you will be. Um, very aware, but not fearful of the warning. That's the difference between a devilish dream or a soulish dream versus a God dream. Because a God dream that's, you know, a warning, you'll be stirred up to be on your guard and to cast those things down. If they're negative, God's warning you to actually pray against that circumstance or that that uh, warning that he's revealing to you and call those things out and condemn the plans of the enemy if necessary, right? Whereas if it's a devilish inspired dream that you'll be, you know, anxious and fearful and, you know, just overwrought and that's that's not God. So that's one way to distinguish a warning dream, if it's really God or not, is what is the the witness of the Spirit on your heart about that. Um, and then again, uh, another way that God speaks to us is through angels. And they definitely, like we just saw there with um, Joseph, is... Uh, you know, they will, and Mary, for that matter, you know, they will appear to you and give you a message. And of course, you know, these things, especially angels, I mean, man, a manifestation of angels, I, I personally have not had one. So I, they're not something you want to rely on and look for, you know, that would be idolatry, really. You know, you're chasing down 
a sign and a wonder as opposed to looking to God for revelation and understanding. We always look to God for wisdom and revelation, and then he, dep- he decides how he wants to reveal that truth to you, right? That's really important because there are some quote-unquote ministries that get off on left field and, I mean, all they're doing is just chasing down angels. And that's not what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to chase down the supernatural. He wants us to seek Him first. And then the supernatural follows us, right? So here's an example of that. Here in Hebrews 1.14, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth? to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So it says right there that they are sent to minister salvation to us. And then if we go to Hebrews 13, 2 also, it says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So angels can definitely lead and assist us and guide us and deliver us, help us, right? And, I mean, Jesus received assistance from angels. Even in Luke twenty-two forty-three, 43, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, simply put, then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. So... Jesus received assistance from angels too. And another example is in Acts 20 or 12 verse 7. And this example is when Peter was shut up in prison. And it says that fervent prayer was persistently made to God by the church for him. And in verse 7 This is the Amplified Version. It says, And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared standing beside him, and a light shone in the place where he was. And the angel gently smote Peter on the side and awakened him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Tighten your belt and bind on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your outer garment around you and follow me and it just goes on and on and so he was delivered out of prison by the hands of an angel who gave him direction so you know if we need direction apparently it can come in the form and the help of an angel too so you know again these are unusual situations that were led but i mean you got to To be thorough, I wanted to mention these ways that God can speak to us also, right? And another another way, of course, is in singing and in praising God. That's how God speaks to us, loud and clear. As it says in Psalms 22, verse 3, this is the King James Bible. It says, For thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So God inhabits our praises. He literally is speaking to us through our praises to him. Right? We are intimately conversing with him in our praises to him. And again, similarly, in Zephaniah, one of my favorites is Zephaniah 3.17. It says, The Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So many times, if you hear a song in your heart just springing up or you wake up with a song in your heart and you didn't manufacture it, you know, I mean, you didn't say, well, I'm going to, where's my song book? You know, it just quote unquote appears in your heart. Well, I think that's many times God singing over you. 
he's just rejoicing over you and that that verse literally means he spins with glee he's so excited over you and and that is his way of leading and guiding you is just him rejoicing and singing over you isn't that awesome that we have a heavenly father who's so excited to be with us all the time and one more verse here again in Ephesians 5:19 it says speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ so that is one way that we can encourage each other and like we read in Zephaniah, be encouraged by God also is through singing and psalming and rejoicing. I mean, you are in, in essence conversing with God, but it's just in melody. It's just with a thankful heart is actual, it's speech to God actually. So those are some ways that God speaks to us, right? And I have some other examples that I want to share with you, but I think I'm going to save those for next time. I'm excited for you to see all the things that God is going to reveal more and more to you and, and enjoy such a rich conversation and more intimacy with your Heavenly Father by understanding these things. Because that is the essence of having an abundant life is being able to connect with your Heavenly Father, right? Through your understanding of what He's speaking to you. I mean, how can you have a relationship with somebody you don't even understand, right? Like I said at the beginning. So reach out to me if you have any questions. And you all have a wonderful week, and I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.